All right, in our last session, we, uh, we talked about communication, which is the way that we express and exchange love. Lo if love were a commodity, you know, if it was a box or something, uh, you know, the way that you, you trade it back and forth is through the process of communication. That's how, that's how you trade love back and forth inside of a relationship. In today's class, uh, I want us to look at ways to keep that loving relationship together, a little bit you know, looking at it from a different perspective. Communicating love messages is what draws us one to another. But you know, in a world that has so many influences that pull us away from one another, we, we need more to kind of maintain that, that relationship. So I want to suggest ways to tie the relationship together in order to protect it from being torn apart. A lot of things and not necessarily bad things that pull us apart. Of course, there are bad things that can pull, you know, that can tear a marriage apart. Uh, we, we know those, but there are some things that are innocent in themselves, you know, work or hobbies or uh, family emergencies, things like that, that happen to everyone and that have an effect on a relationship. So we need, we need ways to kind of bind us, to bind us together. Uh, I refer to these ties as cords of love. And the reason for that, um, based out of, uh, first of all, out of um, Ecclesiastes, the writer in Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if, neither, if, if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can, be, how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him uh, who is alone, two can resist him. And the part I like, it says, a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And so this idea of ties, you know, cords of love, those ties that kind of maintain that relationship, that tie that relationship together. The other uh, source that I have for this idea of cords of love is the book of, the book of Ruth, a marvelous book uh, that teaches us about these cords of love that maintain a relationship. You see, in my view, there are five cords of love that keep a relationship tightly bound. And these, of course, are described quite beautifully in the book of Ruth. That's why I wanted you to kind of read ahead a little bit. Well, let me give you a background on the book of Ruth so we'll know what we're talking about in context. The book of Ruth is a wonderful story of the love and devotion of a young woman who becomes a widow and then takes care of her mother-in-law who is also a widow and she does this at great cost to herself. And in this short book we see the five cords of love that help bind two people together in a loving relationship despite many obstacles. And what's interesting is that the book of Ruth is not a story about a relationship between a man and a woman. It's a, it's a story about a relationship between two women who find themselves widowed at a particular point in their lives. But the idea of the cords of love work in any kind of relationship, my point is, especially uh, if they're applied to a marriage relationship. So the first cord of love that we see in this story of Ruth is the cord of kindness. The cord of kindness. Now again, I don't have time to read the verses. Uh, but I'll tell you the story. Naomi, who is the mother-in-law, uh, she is widowed and she is living far from home. She comes from you know, Israel, but she's not living in Israel at the time. And she has two sons and those sons each have wives. And at some point, both of those sons die and leave her two daughter-in-laws as widows. So you have three widows now uh, trying to make a life for themselves uh, as they have uh, lost their husbands. And the first thing we notice in the first couple of verses is that Naomi releases both of her daughter-in-laws so that they can go home to their people. She releases them from their family obligations so that they can start new lives. Now, 
you know, in, our, in our culture today, that would seem normal. But in the culture back then, the custom of those days was that they would remain with her, with Naomi. These two women would remain with Naomi to help her. But instead, Naomi chooses to sacrifice herself for the good of her daughter-in-laws. You know, shared interest, if we apply this idea of kindness to marriage relationship, shared interests and beauty and intelligence, wealth, power, these things are usually what attract a person to another at the beginning. At the beginning, you know, somebody sets you up, if you're single, let you, it sets you up on a date, let's say, you know, and, and, and the first question normally that you ask is, well, what does he look like? Or what does she look like? Before you get on to what's her IQ? You know what I'm saying? So uh, those are the type of things that attract us at the beginning. But I'll tell you that kindness, kindness given with a good heart is what gives a relationship staying power. Staying power. In the everyday working out of a relationship, it's the little and the large acts of kindness that actually build that relationship. Money does not build a relationship. It builds a house, but it doesn't build a relationship. Or looks, believe it or not, doesn't matter how good looking you are, looks do not build a relationship. Uh, intelligence, you know, how high your IQ, that's not what builds a relationship. Conversely, it's ki kindness is what builds a relationship. Conversely, the lack of kindness, like being impolite or inconsiderate, or being ungrateful or stingy with compliments, or kind gestures, these are the things that lead to boredom. Some people say, you know, you know, people come see me and they say, well, I'm bored in my relationship. I'm bored in my marriage. And when I scratch the surface a little bit, start asking questions, you know, well, do you do this? Do you still do the little kind things that you did at the beginning? Ah, you know, we've been married now six years. We don't need to do that anymore. Wrong, wrong. Kindness, continual acts of kindness, that's what you know, keeps the boredom away. Your partner continues to surprise you and delight you with kind little things that make you, that make you happy. And so kindness is the first cord necessary to secure two people together in any kind of relationship, certainly in a marriage relationship, but just in a friendship, you know, two guys are friends, you know, being kind to each other helps maintain that relationship. The second chord of kindness is loyalty. And I'm going to read just a short passage here in chapter one, beginning in verse 15. It says, then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. This is Naomi talking to Ruth. One of her daughter-in-laws decides, no, I thank you for the offer of going back to my people, and she leaves. But Ruth decides to stay with her mother-in-law, and this is the conversation that they have. So it says, then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, Naomi said, no more to her. And that passage, I mean, that's one of the most, uh, the favorite passages of many people when they're getting married, you know, they want to read something to each other, a passage of scripture. This is one passage that many couples choose to read to one another uh, at, their, uh, at their wedding. Notice Ruth's loyalty to Naomi. Her life and loyalty was sworn to her husband originally and his family, and to that family she remained loyal. To live where they lived, to become as they were, to worship as they worshiped. 
she saw that her life changed for the better because, and we don't mention this, or you know, I didn't mention it, but Ruth was a Moabitess. She wasn't a, she wasn't a Jew. She came from Moab. She was raised with pagan gods and deities. So she was a pagan woman who married a Jew who was a believer in God. And so she wanted to remain loyal to this way of godly living and loyal to its people, even if it meant giving up her chance at remarriage. So for Ruth, being a widow among God's people was better than being married among pagans. The loss of her husband didn't shake her loyalty to his family and to his beliefs. So you know, let's take that lesson and apply it in a, in a modern setting. Uh, trust, loyalty, faithfulness, perseverance, these are the pillars of a lasting relationship. Now, I'll tell you something, each time a crisis or an argument or a disappointment or a sin fails to destroy a relationship, that relationship grows just that much stronger. Have you ever had an argument with a friend, someone that you kind of were just, you know, not a huge friendship, just a friendship, you know, and you had a disagreement, a strong disagreement, and there was words spoken or something like that, and then you, know, you thought about it and you talked to your friend, and yeah, you know, maybe I spoke out of turn or I spoke too quickly, I apologize, you know, I didn't see it your way, whatever, and, and you mend that thing, that friendship. You ever notice that after you've kind of gotten through that, your friendship goes to another level. All of a sudden, it just becomes that much stronger. And so it's the same thing within a marriage relationship. Every time you overcome a crisis, whatever the crisis is, whether it's an argument, whether you fail to do something you ought to do or ought to be or whatever, every time you're able to overcome that kind of crisis in your relationship, it makes your relationship that much, that much stronger. I'll tell you something. Nothing strengthens a relationship more dynamically than a show of loyalty at a critical moment. The idea is you could have cut and run, but you didn't. But you didn't. There was a great movie, uh, what was it, about a, a bus that was run away or something like that, remember? And the, at the end of the movie, the, the heroine you know, was handcuffed to a a pole inside of a train, you know, and it was going to crash, and, and her, her boyfriend you know, or at the time was with her, and he could have, he could have escaped. You know. And he stays with her, and the, you know, the train crashes, and everything blows up and everything, and somehow, you know, after she, all the rubble, she comes out. She's still you know, handcuffed to the pole, unable to get away, and he's on top of her, covering her, protecting her. And, and I mean, I remember seeing that movie at the movies. Sandra Bullock, I think, was her big breakout movie. And, and, and at that scene, everybody went, oh, you know, in the, in the theater, everybody went, oh, what a great guy, he stuck with her. He stayed, he, he could have taken off, but he didn't. You know, when I see my wife or my friend or my family or my church member or a business associate, choose to stay loyal to our relationship when temptation or trial or other options come along, it makes me rejoice and it enables me to actually feel the cords of love that bind us together. And so the second cord of loyalty, a uh, second cord of love rather, is loyalty. Third cord of love in the story is the cord of hard work. The cord of hard work. In the story of Ruth, we see that her relationship with Naomi caused her to actually work very hard. Her and Naomi returned back to Naomi's homeland uh, in Israel, and uh, they have to eat. She doesn't have a husband. And so what she does is she hires herself out, Ruth does, she hires herself out as a hired hand, if you wish, to uh, gather the crops, olives, grapes, whatever to harvest the crop. Now she's not a hired worker. The hired worker got to go in, was paid a certain amount, was fed while he worked, or so on and so forth. She was allowed to be a gleaner, meaning she was behind the hired workers and she picked up the leftovers. She, had, she was a woman, alone, no protection at the time. And so 
she takes a job lower than a farm worker or a farm, no guarantees and no protection. Well, the parallel in today's relationship is obvious. Uh, you got to work at it. She, you know, her, the, her being loyal to Naomi meant that she now had to support her and Naomi. It meant hard physical work for her. So if we want to kind of apply that idea, that lesson to a marriage relationship, it's pretty simple. You want a successful relationship? You got to work at it. You know, a lot of partnerships and marriages and friendships fail simply because of laziness. People are just not putting the effort into the relationship. You know, people think that relationships kind of nourish themselves, but they don't. You've got to continually care for it, much like you care for a garden. You would never think of just planting seed in a garden and then forgetting about it, thinking, you know what? Sometime in May, I'm going to plant the seeds, throw a little water there, and I'll come back in September and just gather the fruit. Well, we know that that's not how it works, right? You've got to work at that thing. You've got to tend to it. And yet sometimes people think, well, I got married, you know, we're married, that's it, you know, we're, in, we're in for life, don't have to work at it anymore. And of course we all know that that's not, that's not so. You know, my mother, who's long gone now, but she used to say that a relationship was like a fire in a fireplace. You have to continually add wood and you've got to stir the ashes to keep that flame going. Remember that old reggae song, you know, stir it up, Bob Marley. A relationship, you've got, to, you've got to keep stirring it up. And the best way to do this in a relationship, to stir up that relationship, I go back to my old you know, last lesson, communicate honestly and deeply with each other on a regular basis. You know those heart-to-heart -heart talks? So many times we, we let things go by or we swallow our feelings and resentment and anger you know, and we just jam it down there and it just boils and percolates. You know? A good and honest talk from time to time is liberating and it's joyful. And you know, just because you're having a real heart to heart talk doesn't mean you've solved everything but it sure is a step in the right direction. When we really, really speak to each other from the heart, it clears the air and it helps us to go forward in our relationship with enthusiasm, honest communication. Some people, you know, they, they, you know, something goes wrong in a relationship, whether it's a parent-child or you know, husband-wife, friend-to-friend, you know, something goes wrong, and their natural instinct is just to shut down. Doop. Shut down, they shut down. That's how, how, how I'm going to deal with this thing I don't like. I'm not talking. I'm not communicating. You know, it's just going to be past the salt, past the milk. <laughs> you know, did you buy cat food? You know, that'll be the... And that doesn't resolve anything. That just makes it worse. So the way to stir up a relationship is honest communication. Secondly, do things together. Work and play and serve and learn and explore and build and dream together. You know, the natural and easy thing to do is to do our own thing, whatever that thing is, because it's easier to do our own thing. You know why it's easy to do my own thing? Well, I don't need your opinion. <laughs> I don't need your opinion to do what I want to do. When I do what I want to do, Guess what? There's nobody to say no or let's change it or can we do it on Tuesday or I don't like doing that. No, I get to do what I want to do. But we can't have it both ways. You can't have the intimacy and the rewards that come with a good relationship but continually ignore it in order to do your own thing. It doesn't work. Relationships work because people go from their own thing to our thing. And when people become fiercely protective of our thing, that's when the relationship begins to grow. And the work here comes from the trial and error of figuring out what is our thing. Now this doesn't mean that we abandon all of the things we like to do by ourselves, of course not. It does mean, however, 
that we make room for some new things that build our relationship and not just build ourselves up. A third thing to do to stir up that relationship, share spiritual things. Every relationship improves with Christ. You know, that should be a slogan on this course. Every relationship improves with Christ. Business relationships open up. Friendships are deeper. Marriages become sanctified when the Spirit of Christ enters the picture. You know, I've quoted this statistic to you before, but it, it bears repeating. In a survey to find out the effect of religion, if you wish, on marriage, they surveyed you know, the rate of divorce. And for people who had no spiritual life whatsoever, she didn't go to church, she had no spiritual life, he, you know, no spiritual life from either one, the marriage rate is about one out of two. In the relationships where at least one of the partners were a committed Christian or committed you know, as a person of faith, if you wish, and the other one wasn't, the rate dropped to one out of 40. And when both partners were people of faith, committed to their faith, where spiritual things were very important to them and to their relationship, the divorce rate dropped to one out of 400. Still there, you know, we still have people get divorced in the church, that's nothing new. But not at the rate that people who have no faith um, divorce. So sharing spiritual things is not simply saying, you know, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, or we're believers. Sharing spiritual things means to be actively involved in spiritual things like worshiping together, or praying together, or serving together, or learning together. You know, a relationship based on Christ has hope not only for this life, but for the next life as well. It's the one thing that people keep telling me every time that, you know, unfortunately I have to do a funeral and I'm with the surviving spouse, whoever it is, when the spouse who's passed away was a person of faith, was a person who was a believer, there's a lot of hope there. Because Christ tells us that all of us will raise from the dead and as we raise from the dead, not as unconscious people, I'll be me and you'll be you. We'll know who we are and who we were. And I believe the Bible teaches us that we'll also know who we are, each other, in heaven. Otherwise, where would the joy be? There'd be no joy. So let's not lose focus here. The third chord of love is based on hard work and the best way to work at a relationship is to communicate honestly and do things together and share spiritual life. You know, the easiest thing to do in a relationship is to take each other for granted. I'm busy, I'm tired. I'm selfish, I'm distracted. However, people who enjoy successful relationships do so because they've invested time and effort into them, just like every other successful thing that they do in their lives. They work at it. You want to get ahead in your job? Work at it. Want to get ahead in your marriage? Got to work at it. Number four, the cord of patience. This is where another character comes in. Uh, to the picture as far as Ruth is concerned, chapter three all the way to chapter four. You have to understand that the only way that Ruth would guarantee a better and stable life for herself was to remarry. Now the custom at the time was that whoever married her now had to promise that their firstborn son would inherit her dead husband's land. It was the idea of a buyback or a, you know, a, a, a redeemer. The, uh, the family redeemer, when a man died and left no inheritance, no son to inherit the land and so on and so forth, someone from his family would take his widow and would have a child and that child would have the dead husband's name and would inherit his property. Of course, think about that for a second. There were few mature men who wanted the responsibility of raising a child to carry another man's name and inherit another man's property. So Ruth, you know, she was not a virgin, obviously. She was a liability as far as you know, finance and property was concerned. So she, didn't, she was not marriage material. She didn't have a big hope to remarry. 
but she was patient and she was willing to follow her mother-in-law's advice, even if it was a long shot. Now the long shot in this story was that the richest man in the area would not only marry her and provide an heir for her dead husband, but he would do this at personal, financial, and social risk to himself. And so we have another character enter the picture and that's Boaz. Boaz is the one who owned the land, the one who gave her the work, provided protection for her. He was kind to her. Beautiful episode here shows us that the best partnerships work together patiently for the good of the relationship. You know, I've learned from experience to listen. My wife's name is Lise, as most of you know. I've learned to listen to her advice especially when her counsel makes me upset. <laughs> the more upset I am because of what she's just told me, down deep inside, the more I know she's right. And the proof of it is I'm upset. She's nailed me. She's got it, ding, you know. My wife is not a big talker, but when she does, she hits it right on the head. I've learned to listen to her and be patient. I've also learned that not all matters and obstacles in a relationship can be settled in one day or can be settled in one decision. I remember you know, way back you know, when we were first married, maybe the first 10, 15 years or so, and you know, we'd have a thing. You know, we call them uh, fender benders. You know, we, accidental fender. Nobody was on purpose trying to get into each other's space, but somehow we crashed into each other. There was a dispute, a di you know, whatever. And the, the way I am, you know, object motivated, task oriented, you know, A type, get the list done. I wanted to check that thing off. You know, disagreement, check. All right, let's talk. And you know, it'd be three in the morning, we'd still be going around and around and she'd be nodding off and nodding off. You know. And it took me a while to figure out, you know what, you can't, you can't solve everything in one conversation. Sometimes you just take a bite out of it and leave some for tomorrow and you know, we misunderstand the idea where Paul is saying, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. He doesn't mean you've got to solve everything before sundown. When he says that, what he's talking about is, don't be angry for longer than, a, than, than that season. In other words, yes, it's okay to be angry for a time, but don't let that anger continue on. Don't feed it. You know, don't let, you know, before the sun goes down, deal with the emotion, let it dissipate. He's not saying you can solve everything in one shot. You can't. Some problems need a lot of discussion and a lot of prayer and a lot of give and take. I've also learned that when two flawed, imperfect, sinful people are in a relationship, there are going to be offenses. I'm 100% sure of this. I'm not 100% sure of a lot of things, but this I'm 100% sure. You're not perfect, your wife's not perfect. You plan to live together at close quarters. <laughs> I guarantee you something's going to give. Someday you're not, you know, you're going to disagree. He's going to offend you. She's going to say something that really ticks you off. Just be ready for it. And I've also learned that patience is often the ingredient in a relationship that maintains balance when things get rocky. You know, if loyalty is the rope that binds you closer together, then patience is the rope that keeps you in the relationship when the other ropes break away. Patience is the safety rope that keeps you together when all the other ropes fail. Patience is the willingness to go on despite discomfort. Some people are willing to be married. I love marriage, I'm willing to be married. I'll be married for life, so long as it doesn't hurt. So long as I'm not uncomfortable. So long as things go my way. So long as she is exactly the person I thought she was when I get married, or he is exactly the person I thought he was when I married. You know, so long as all those things are there, I'm in it, I'm good. But you need to have patience when you find out the opposite. Well, he's not the person I thought, or he's not completely the person I thought he was, or I hoped he would be. And the situation we have, 
You know, I thought that by now we'd own two houses and a car and whatever, and boy, we're still living in an apartment, you know? Patience is the willingness to keep going despite the discomfort of the, of the moment. It's the willingness to wait. It's the ability to carry a heavy load. It's the desire to forgive. It's the ability to make allowances for, to give the benefit of the doubt. It's the choice to try to understand and work out the weakness and failings of someone we're in a relationship with. It requires patience. Nobody is born with patience. You don't believe me? Just watch a little baby if his parents are too slow with the diaper, uh, with a diaper change or a meal. They will let you know. And I'm not talking about the baby you know, is thinking, you know, I'm hungry, I, I, I haven't been fed yet. I'll give it another 25, 30 minutes and if mom doesn't nurse me, you know, maybe I'll say, hey mom. You go four minutes past the time, I know some of our grandchildren, you go four minutes past the, the nursing time, boy, they'll let you know, all right. Now we make allowances for them because they're babies. And what do they need to develop as they grow up and they grow into adult? Well, they, they learn to be patient. But patience always pays off with a reward of some kind. In our story about Ruth, her patience led her to a loving and kind husband. I mean, she could have been quickly married to maybe one of the younger workers, but she didn't, she didn't do that. The true reward of patience, however, is that through patience we grow in our ability to love and to hope and to be wise. You know, impatient people, they make mistakes. Impatient people ruin relationships and they rarely grow into emotional and spiritual maturity. Listen, patience is what enables us to love despite the unlovely things we eventually see in our partners. Of all the chords, it's the one most responsible for keeping relationships together over a great number of years. And let's face it, we live in a society that's not patient. We go to Mickey D's, you know, and if our hamburger is not coming out in three and a half minutes, we're going, well, what's going on? What took so long? Four and a half minutes? You know, I, I've been here five minutes waiting for my hot meal. What's wrong? <laughs> We live in that society. We eat something in a bowl, or, you know, and then we just throw it away. We throw away stuff. We get it right away, and then we just throw it away. Well, that, that mindset you know, leaches into our relationships. We get married in a hurry, and then if it doesn't work, we just throw it away. You know? yeah, get rid of her, get rid of them, you know, start over, press the reset button. Patience, patience always has its reward. Okay, fifth chord here, and that's the chord of faith. From the very beginning, no one could know what God's plan was for all of this, for Ruth's life. That Ruth and Boaz, that, that man who owned the land and so on and so forth, that Ruth and Boaz would produce a child who would be the grandfather of the great King David. David, the greatest king of Israel, David the prophet, David the one who wrote the beautiful book of Psalms, David who would be in the direct lineage of Jesus through his earthly father Joseph. Their faith in God began with Naomi and then Ruth and then the man she married, Boaz. And each of them entered into a relationship with another based on faith. Ruth was in a relationship with her mother-in-law based on faith. She didn't want to leave her because of her faith. And then Boaz with Ruth. And their faith was rewarded beyond expectations. You know, the greatest hope that they had was to simply have a good marriage and some children and grandchildren, which is a pretty good you know, dream to have. But look at the reward they got. Their reward of faith was that in addition to these things, they also secured a direct relationship with the future king and then with the future Messiah. They had no way of knowing this. You know, somebody said, all relationships end in failure or death without exception. Think about that. That's true, isn't it? 
As one speaker has said, all marriages end at the divorce court or the funeral home. That's kind of true, kind of a pessimistic way of looking at things, but it's true, isn't it? The first four cords of love cannot protect you against death. However, those relationships that have as a basis faith in God, trust in Christ, they have an element, they have a cord that the others don't have. You know, some people say, well, I've seen a lot of people you know, who, who don't believe in God and don't have a spiritual life and they have a nice marriage. Yeah, they got those first four chords going. But the ones that have the cord of faith in Christ, these relationships have the hope that their relationship will transcend this world into the next. And this reality and promise of God is what gives a relationship between a Christian husband and a Christian spouse or Christian friends or family that extra measure of joy and hope and confidence. And so adding the cord of faith to our relationship closes the circle of eternity between ourselves and other believers no matter how we're related to them. So there they are, the five cords of love that promote a happy and successful marriage. The cord of kindness builds up a relationship. The cord of loyalty binds it strongly together. The cord of hard work breaks the boredom. The cord of patience balances it in troubled times. And the cord of faith transforms it into another dimension. Now you may be thinking, hey, wait a minute here. I thought the title of this lesson was The Cord of Love, The Cords of Love. Isn't that necessary for a happy and lasting relationship? Love, how come that's not there? Well, the answer is yes, love is necessary and it's there. I've just presented it to you. This is what true love looks like when it is present and being expressed by two individuals in any relationship. When you take the five strands and you weave them together into one cord, that's the cord of love. So my prayer is that these cords of love will surround and bless each of your relationships as you build a great marriage that will enable you to be and that's the overarching theme of our series, In Love for Life. Remember, I'm telling you, it's possible to be in love for life. Okay, that's our lesson this week. Next week, lesson is entitled Holy Sex, part number one. All right, I thank you for your attention. You're dismissed from class. We'll see you next time.